Hello and welcome to Maximum Jessica Simpson, the first talking book about Jessica. It was written and researched by Ben Graham, music is by David Williams, and it's read by Sean Jones. You can check out our full catalogue on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. Um, for the president, actually. We're going over to the White House at 4.15. I've sang there before, and I messed up the words to God Bless America, so. (laughs) Jessica Simpson is perhaps best known today as one half of the star couple in MTV's Newlyweds reality television show. Jessica dominates the screen over husband Nick Latchie, and her charismatic, dizzy personality and idiosyncratic sayings have won her a devoted following across the globe, as well as acres of column inches in the popular press. The show has propelled Jessica to superstardom, where her very name has become a byword for a certain kind of celebrity, and her oft-repeated sayings are as instantly recognisable as her blonde bombshell image and sweet southern drawl of a voice. Things, however, were not always this way. Jessica Simpson first achieved fame as a teen pop rival to the likes of Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera in 1999, going straight to the top of the charts with the single I Wanna Love You Forever and the album Sweet Kisses. She gained further notoriety by proudly proclaiming herself to be a virgin, insisting that she was saving herself for marriage. But as Jessica moved further away from her fluffy teeny bopper beginnings, so her record sales dropped. Her initial pre-teen fan base moved on to the next overhyped fad, while Jessica's attempts to mature as an artist seemed to be ignored by a public all too willing to pigeonhole her as just another one-hit wonder. Then came marriage and the TV show, and Jessica's fortunes were revived. Suddenly, her pop career was on the up too, as her album was re-released and climbed up the charts once again. It had been one hectic roller coaster ride for a performer still in her early 20s, but already making her first comeback. Looking back over the years, however, it almost seems preordained, as though Jessica's trials and tribulations were merely tests of her faith and her will to succeed, obstacles that she was bound to overcome in order to fulfil her lifetime's destiny. Jessica Ann Simpson was born on the 10th of July 1980 in the small Texas town of Abilene. When she was very young, her parents moved to Richardson, another small Texas town outside of Dallas, which was where the future princess of pop spent her formative years. Jessica's father, Joe, was a psychologist and a youth minister who preached in the local Baptist church. His wife, Tina, was a devoted mother who loved music nearly as much as her two children, Jessica and little sister, Ashley, the youngest of the pair by four years. Jessica grew up surrounded by all kinds of music – pop, rock, soul, gospel, jazz and classical. Her family were astonished by her early ability to sing along with almost any tune that came on the radio, picking it up at first listen and joining in faultlessly. With this gift, it's hardly surprising that she was singing in the church choir at her father's congregations from the age of five onwards. She loved to sing and loved the attention and admiration it earned her. While she enjoyed raising her voice in praise of God, Jessica was also a fan of the secular pop music of the 80s and 90s. The first CD she bought was by the soul singer Amy Grant, and she soon became a huge fan of the great emotional divas such as Whitney Houston, Celine Dion and Mariah Carey. Little did she realise that not only would she one day be favourably compared to these artists herself, but that she would have the chance to perform alongside them as an equal. In many ways, Jessica was a normal, happy, outgoing child. She loved to do all the things that other children of her age loved to do, and had no problem fitting in and getting along with other kids. She was bright, popular and funny, and yet from day one, there was something that marked her out as different from her peers as well. From as early as she could remember, Jessica knew that she didn't want to have a normal, boring life like all of her friends. 
She knew that she was not destined to be another anonymous housewife or working mother, toiling away in an office, supermarket or factory to support her kids. She was sure that God had other plans for her. God had singled her out to be different, to be special. Jessica knew this and her parents agreed. Jessica Simpson was a driven child. She was driven to act, sing and entertain. Yet she had more serious underlying motives as well. Lying in her bedroom at night, looking at the posters on her wall and singing along with the radio, the eight-year-old Jessica swore that if God would help her to achieve her ambitions of becoming a world-famous pop star, then she would use her fame and success to help others and to spread his word. Even from such an early age, she knew that her mission in life was to spread love and joy and happiness around the world. And she was determined to succeed. inspired me to be a singer maybe my mom or my, my family everybody's very musical and I think just growing up singing around the piano and I was just my career happened by chance I was just singing in church and a guy was there and signed me to a gospel deal so it just kind of like fell in my lap so I was like oh I guess you know this is what I want to do Jessica began her first term at Dallas JJ Pierce High School full of confidence in her future Though she was only 11 years old, it was the beginning of a new decade, the 90s, and she was sure that the next 10 years would bring her everything that she desired. She was still singing in the church choir, but although she was determined that she wanted to perform to much larger audiences and to be known around the world, she wasn't yet certain what form her show business career would take. At the age of 12, Jessica took her first step into that wider world and auditioned for Disney Television's Mickey Mouse Club. An American TV institution for nearly half a century, the show features an ever-changing lineup of child presenters come cheerleaders known as the Mouseketeers. Many former Mouseketeers have gone on to glittering show business careers as adults, most notably in recent times Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera. Like her future rivals, Jessica auditioned for the show knowing that it was a recognised launching pad for singers, actors and entertainers, a place where you could learn your trade and make connections, as well as getting your face and hopefully your voice onto a nationally syndicated TV show on a weekly basis. But Jessica was not destined to become another protégé of the Great Mouse. Her singing talent and effervescent personality got her through the preliminary auditions and things looked promising when she finally reached the Mickey Mouse Club finals. Then, in her own words, Jessica freaked out. I froze, she later said, but the experience made me even stronger and more convinced that I was on the right path. Her failure to win a place on the Mickey Mouse Club was a wake-up call for Jessica. She knew she had the talent, but now she knew that she was going to have to work hard if she was going to get where she wanted as well. Nothing was going to be handed to her on a plate. In many ways, before the audition, she was incredibly naive. She reached them and found that all the other kids, though only her own age, were hard-nosed professionals by comparison. They were talent show veterans, with stage school backgrounds and model agency standard photographic portfolios. In contrast, Jessica had sung in church and had a couple of casual Polaroid snaps. It was like entering a different world. Undaunted by the experience, she continued to work on her singing, songwriting and performing skills, taking voice and acting lessons. Her ambitions had come sharply into focus and she now knew, as she hadn't before the auditions, that she wanted to be a singer above all else. She also continued to be actively involved in her local church and during the long school holidays it was not uncommon for her to spend several weeks at a Christian youth summer camp. The summer of 1993 was no exception. But as shortly after her 13th birthday, Jessica looked forward to another few weeks of swimming, hiking, campfire sing-alongs and Bible study, she didn't realise that she would also experience her first big break into the world of the music business, right in the place where she least expected it. 
It was usual for the Christian youth summer camps to have an array of visiting guest speakers who would deliver lectures or talks designed to inspire, enlighten or otherwise guide the receptive young minds gathered together in the outdoors. On this occasion, one of the speakers was the founder and chairman of a newly launched Christian music label. The Christian Music Network is an important and influential market in the American pop scene, with its own separate distribution network of record companies, radio stations, stores, live venues and, of course, singers, songwriters and bands. Many of these eventually cross over to the mainstream and go on to great success, such as the rock groups Creed and Evanescence. But even within its own confines, Christian music commands a sizeable audience, with artists working in all current pop genres, from gospel to death metal, via soul, hip-hop, dance, punk and more beside. The only difference is that Christian music artists deliver lyrics that reflect their faith, free from profanity, violence and overt sexual references, preaching instead a message of love, tolerance, humility, unity and salvation in the Lord. Proclaim Records was only a small label, even by Christian music standards, but they were still on the lookout for new artists. When they happened to see and hear Jessica performing an unaccompanied rendition of the gospel standard Amazing Grace, they knew that they had stumbled across something special. It wasn't a formal audition, just a spontaneous heartfelt rendering of a favourite song that Jessica had sung at camp countless times. The only difference was that this time, someone in the music business was listening. By the time that Jessica returned to school the following semester, she had signed her first record deal. It seemed like she was finally on her way, but many troubled times still lay in front of her. I started out in gospel and I shot my album, um, my gospel album, after my record company had folded and they, I, I couldn't get a deal in the Christian music because they said I was sexy and not cute. So um, I was kind of, I was really hurt because at that point, you know, I was just, I wanted to sing about God and have everybody listen to it. During the next three years, as well as studying hard, sitting exams and eventually graduating from high school, Jessica Simpson was also busy recording her debut album for the Proclaim label. Recorded over numerous sessions at a succession of small local studios, the LP came together bit by bit, song by song, with tracks being laid down months apart, whenever the tight budget and the pressures of her schoolwork would allow. The album was a mixture of gospel, pop and soul, showcasing Jessica's pure energetic vocals, which were already incredibly accomplished for a singer still in her early teens. The message in all the lyrics, as befitted a Christian music label, was one of redemption, faith, love and suffering, though these are universal themes throughout all types of pop music. The album was finally finished in 1996, when Jessica was 16, but it would never see the light of day. With the album ready to go and awaiting release, Proclaim Records went bankrupt. The label folded, leaving Jessica with no deal, no career and no contacts. All the hard work and the long, gruelling process of getting the album recorded seemed to have come to nothing. There would be no product to promote, nothing to show for it. Effectively, she was back where she started. It was as though she had completely wasted the past three or more years. It's easy to imagine how devastated she must have felt, and Jessica's family, who were behind her all the way, were equally affected. They must have been tempted to throw in the towel, to decide that her singing career just wasn't meant to be. But their faith in her, and Jessica's faith in her own talent, ability and dreams, was too strong to let them do that. So the record company had folded, no matter. They still had the recordings. With God's help, they swore they'd press, promote and sell Jessica's record themselves. And that was just what they did. All the family rallied round with Jessica's grandmother paying for a limited private pressing of the album, while her father took on the role of her manager. 
Together they began a series of tours of Christian youth conferences up and down America, with Joe Simpson driving and preaching, and his daughter Jessica singing and selling copies of her album from the boot of their car afterwards. At these conferences, she would often play to audiences of 20,000 people or more, appearing alongside established Christian music stars like Kirk Franklin, God's Property and C.C. Winans. Jessica Simpson was a hit in her own right on the Christian Youth Conference circuit, and she soon sold out of that limited home pressing of her album. Word spread about her talent and charisma, and soon she was being talked about and written about all over the Christian music scene, with her name a guaranteed draw at any gathering or event. It was inevitable that before long her fame would spread into the mainstream music business. When that opportunity came, Jessica would have to choose whether she was going to continue spreading the word of the Lord alongside her father, or whether she was ready to abandon the pulpit in return for a chance to reach a far wider audience than her wildest dreams could have imagined. When I went into the secular business, I just felt like it was God opening a bigger door to be a positive role model for even more people. And um, it was actually the best change that I ever made. Thomas D. Mottola grew up in a traditional Italian-American family in the Bronx district of New York. His father was a customs broker and the Mottola household was always filled with the sound of music. Tommy himself was a gifted trumpet player, so good in fact that he won a scholarship to a private school. However, he soon switched to guitar and began cutting class so often that his family eventually sent him away to a military academy, the strict rules and discipline of which Tommy hated. He was constantly running away, but eventually did a deal with his parents whereby he would agree to stay out of trouble if they would let him leave the military academy and come back home. Music and deal-making would prove to be the twin foundations on which Tommy built his life. Keeping his side of the bargain was not always included. Despite his promise to his parents, he continued to misbehave, joining a rock group, drag racing, running with gangs and partying hard. He attempted to become a professional actor, landing a couple of bit parts in second-rate movies, and fared slightly better as a singer, recording two flop singles for Epic Records under the pseudonym of T.D. Valentine. But his big break and his true vocation came when he took over the management of a struggling white soul duo by the name of Hall & Oates. Hall & Oates would become one of the biggest musical names of the 1980s, but Tommy Mottolo was making a substantial profit on them even before that. In 1975, he set up his own management company, Don Tommy Enterprises, later renamed Champion Entertainment. His clients included Carly Simon and John Mellencamp, and in the 80s he sold his stable to CBS Records, becoming head of their Columbia subsidiary in 1987. CBS Columbia was swallowed up by Sony Entertainment in 1988 and Mottolo was placed in charge of their whole American division, supervising the careers of artists like Bruce Springsteen and Michael Jackson. By 1993 he was the company president and by 1998 he was the chairman and chief executive and one of the most powerful, aggressive and flamboyant players in the global music industry. Mottola is known for his larger-than-life wise guy persona and for playing up a tongue-in-cheek Goodfellas gangster persona. He's also legendary for having discovered and signed an unknown 18-year-old Mariah Carey in 1988, for marrying her in 1993 and for divorcing her in 1998. This was the same year that Jessica Simpson walked into his office for a private audition. He signed her the moment he heard her sing. Musically, at least, he must have thought that he had found the new Mariah already. Jessica Simpson had heard of Tommy Mottola, of course, not least as the husband of one of her greatest heroines and role models. But she couldn't believe it when she heard that he was interested in signing her to Sony. 
By this time, however, word of her success within the Christian music scene had spread, and many believed that she had what it took to make it big in the mainstream music business as well. Jessica agreed to sign with Sony on the condition that she wouldn't have to compromise her Christian ideals or beliefs. She was open about her faith and what she intended to do, and what she definitely wouldn't do right from the start. Tommy was completely supportive, telling her that he believed she could change the world with the power of her heart and music. That was when Jessica knew that she had found her home at Sony and knew that it was in God's plan for her to make the music she wanted to make and to reach as many people as she could. Besides seeing it well, um, when I was younger, when I, when I was in high school, I was going to go to college and I was going to major in psychology because I like to encourage people. But I think that I really would probably go into doing makeup. <laughs> Is that shallow? Jessica began her mainstream pop career with the single I've Got My Eyes On You and a support slot on boy band 98 Degrees Heated Up Tour. She also had a song, Did You Ever Love Somebody, featured on the Dawson's Creek soundtrack in April 1999. While the single failed to chart, it was intended as little more than a professional demo, introducing her to the music business at large and testing the waters before making her big splash. The tour, too, was hardly high profile and was more a case of allowing Jessica to gain experience of singing every night on a professionally managed pop tour and seeing how she went down with the 98 Degrees audience before launching her in her own right. The tour was a success in more ways than one, for it was here that Jessica first met Nick Latchie, then just one part of the all-singing, all-dancing 98 Degrees lineup. They quickly became friends and then started dating. However, both were at crucial stages in their careers and agreed that for the time being, work had to come first. Work for Jessica meant the recording of her debut album proper. Unlike her previous recording sessions with Proclaim Records, she found that Sony expected her to operate on a tight schedule, although in return they did offer her a somewhat larger budget, along with the best songwriters, producers and musicians in the business. Jessica, for her part, had been waiting her whole life for this opportunity and had a clear vision of what she wanted to achieve in the studio. She described making music as her life's work and was determined that her songs would amount to more than just cute radio fodder. Sweet Kisses, Jessica's debut album, opened with its first single, I Wanna Love You Forever. On the song's release in October 1999, CD Now described Jessica's vocals as the typical top 40 combination of breathy wonder mixed with moments of chest-thumping sincerity, before adding that Simpson at least seems to mean it more than, say, Britney Spears, who never seems to mean anything. This was not the last time that Jessica would be compared to Britney Spears. The press and media seemed to delight in setting the pair of them up as rivals, though in real life they would go on to become good friends. Moreover, if anyone bothered to listen closely to their respective songs, they would find that Britney and Jessica actually had little in common. Britney's style tends more towards high-energy dance pop, while Jessica has always been a classic ballad singer at heart. If Britney teases her audience with a knowing manipulation of pop clichés a la Madonna, then Jessica, as CD now noted, genuinely means it, and her songs of love and pain come straight from the heart. I Wanna Love You Forever was a point in question, a soaring, passionate ballad, the lyrics of which Jessica delivered with stunning emotion and sincerity. Despite being written by two of the most respected songwriters in the entire music industry, Sam Waters of Colour Me Bad and Mariah Carey's songwriter Louis Biancanella, no one can deny that Jessica makes the song her own, investing it with every fibre of her being. The record-buying public seemed to agree, and by the end of the year, the song was on top of the Billboard Hot 100, staying at the number one spot for six weeks and earning Jessica her first platinum disc. 
She promoted the single with a tour opening for Ricky Martin, yet by the end of it she was arguably already more popular and successful than the living La Vida Loca crooner. The album's second single, Where You Are, also went top 10 on its release in March 2000 and was featured in the soundtrack to the film Here on Earth. The song was a duet with boyfriend Nick Latchey and was another emotional ballad, though this one dealt with quite a dark subject. It's a song, quite honestly, about death, Jessica admitted, but it examines it from a positive spiritual way. I think anyone who's gone through the sadness of that sort of loss will be able to draw peace and comfort from that song. A third single, I Think I'm In Love With You, followed in June and was a number one for Jessica in Canada. Another highlight of the album was the song Heart of Innocence, which, though not released as a single, attracted a lot of attention for celebrating Jessica's vow to remain chaste until marriage. She dedicated the song to her future husband, no matter who he might be. Jessica and Nick were not yet engaged, but Nick completely understood and accepted her decision to remain a virgin until her wedding night. I believe in one true love, so I really wanted this song not to be cheesy or preachy, but rather just truthful, because I do believe in abstinence and commitment, Jessica explained. The lyrics came straight from a dream I had, and are so personal and real to me because I know that innocence can be sexy, and that you can be confident and at one with your sexuality and your womanliness without having sex. I am. It was not only her commitment to old-fashioned moral values and her obvious refusal to be manipulated that set Jessica apart from the manufactured pop bimbos she was often compared to. Unlike the majority of pop starlets, Jessica co-wrote many of her own songs and was concerned that her lyrics have a valid and empowering message for her young fans. Take Woman In Me, for instance, a raunchy rocker which she performs on Sweet Kisses with Sony label mates and fellow Tommy Mottler protégé's Destiny's Child. The song addresses issues of self-esteem and self-worth, as Jessica feels that the most important thing is that people learn to love themselves for who they are and that they appreciate all of the beauty that's in their souls. Jessica's audience certainly appreciated what she was doing for them, as her debut album raced to the top of the chart and went double platinum within a year of its release. In addition, she was named number 13 Singles Artist of the Year in 2000 and won two Teen Choice Awards for Breakout Artist and Love Song of the Year, the latter for Where You Are. It seemed as if finally her every dream was coming true, yet her struggles were still far from over.